All right, thanks everyone for joining us for a, another exciting episode of the Learning Analytics Learning Network uh, webinar slash knowledge series. One of the challenges that learning analytics has as a field is it's a young field. And essentially what that means is there's a lot of things we're still navigating. You know, what, what, is a, what is good research design in learning analytics? What are, uh, what, what are methods that are unique to learning analytics versus methods that say are incorporated from other fields and so on? So these are open-ended consequential questions that we're still navigating. One of the more significant lessons that I think we can learn is from other fields that have greater maturity and have dealt with challenges that are just starting to get onto the horizon within the learning analytics field. The area where I think we can probably learn the most is from what's been happening in psychology over the last five to 10 years. And essentially psychology was a field that deals with some of the same questions we do, which is everything we're doing is a proxy, meaning we can't directly see a thought process. So instead we have to look at an output and then try and trace back from that output the evidence that supports it and what that might mean in terms of what happened. So when we see students having certain grades or certain dropout factors in a course, the, we move back from that to try and explain what's happening and then to build a model that we can then use to both describe and predict what's going on in other kinds of scenarios. So learning analytics faces that same challenge that we're dealing with these ephemeral complex knowledge processes that we can't directly observe and we have to build models in order to better understand. What happened in psychology though, is the wheels fell off the bus a little bit in that instead of focusing on those proxies, what became critical and which became a flaw was the attention turned to discrete methods of analysis that produced certain indicators of significance. And this resulted in what is now called the replication crisis, which is a series of established developed studies ending up being questioned or concerned uh, about being accurate and reflecting what's actually going on in students learning and learning related processes. That's where I think we can learn a lot because psychology has been doing hard work over the last five years trying to undo the damages of the replication crisis and a lot of what they've been focusing on is the use of open science and open science methods. So with that note, we've got a colleague from uh, University of South Australia, Fernando, who's going to, he's a research associate, his area of expertise is looking at uh, human artificial cognition, specifically around some of the challenges in um, being able to deal with algorithmic trust and the confidence that people have in the outputs of these artificial cognitive processes. And his background is in psychology with a lot of experience in looking at the ways that the open science movement is starting to influence and impact other parts of the education sector. So on that note, Fernando, great to have you join us. Take it over. Thank you, George. All right, so yeah, as George said, it's basically describing things that have happened in psychology in relation to redesigning the field, revising the field, and checking what's happening behind the curtains. So um, there are some aspects. OK, the first one is a little survey that I like to run. So um, I think I copied the link to the survey on the chat. So you can just click on it and just answer the questions. Ideally, well, that's my goal. The idea that you answer the questions before I end the talk, because I like to have in your ideas or conceptions of the field of the topic before I deliver some of the key concepts. Okay, so some of the things that we need to cover are, well, open science, obviously the definition, some examples, uh, something that is called the pre-registration initiative, which is a big, big thing in relation to open science. Um, another topic is uh, reproducibility, replicability, and robustness. And actually, I took this words from a preprint that is just out there and I'll show you later on the, the screenshot of the preprint is very very informative I highly recommend it and you'll see you will see it later on but there is a lot of literature about it and it's coming out from the past five to seven years and then some approaches that in my view enhance or help to tackle these three issues reproducibility replicability and robustness and actually there is another keyword here that I didn't mention that is called generalizability 
Um, the reason why I want to mention it is because it is another key issue in relation to these three R's, is generalizability. Um, and lastly, I'll discuss issues in relation to measurement, measurement and measurement. And the thing is that in my perspective, this is something that is kind of forgotten as shuffle aside when it comes to all these topics. And people tend to ignore it, but actually it's an essential component of these three R's. So let's have a look at the open science. Okay, so this is a very broad definition. Uh, open science is the movement to make scientific research, including publications, data, physical samples, and so forth, and its dissemination accessible to all levels of an inquiring society, amateur or professional. And the ultimate goal is to increase transparency. Now, I, I changed the color of the word here because this one is another key concept in relation to open science. And I'll show you later a paper that came out uh, late last year or early this year talking precisely about transparency in relation to AI, which is a field that pertains to or relates very closely to educational data mining and learning analytics. So in a snapshot, you will see that open science includes all these things. So you have open access publications, open data, open source software, open hardware, open evaluation, open science infrastructures, and so on and so on. This is actually kind of a latest addition. And it's more, well, it's in relation to including knowledge from non-Western cultures. In this case, it would be indigenous knowledge systems. Now, I'd like to start an example of open science talking about something that happened last year. This is an article that came out in, um, that was in BBC News. And the question is, if there is life floating in the clouds of Venus? And this is the actual article that was talking about that time. So what I found particularly interesting is this last bit. If you look at the paper, you will see this. We have data availability, and there is a repository which, which is publicly available, where you can find the raw data. It's not, it's not pre-processed data, it's the raw data. And also, they provide the Fernando, code. Sorry. Fernando, can yeah. I just interrupt for a little bit? There's something yeah. with your microphone. It keeps fading in and out. I don't know if you have a yeah. bad microphone or what, but or if anyone else is noticing, it just dropped in the chat. Maybe it's just me, but uh, you, you start talking and then you fade in your quiet. You know, okay, someone else says they have the same thing. You fade in your very quiet and then you come back on. So I don't know exactly what the issue <laughs> is, but just letting you know that's what we're right. hearing and not hearing. Just let me check something here just quickly. Uh... Just checking the sound settings. But now, can you hear me or, or not? Yeah, I think I think we can just keep. I'm not sure why we we had the yeah. you would we would hear you, but you would get very quiet. It's almost like it's picking up something in the background. Okay. And uh, or it would, but keep going. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, that's okay. So um, I quite like this part. Um, that's an interview that was done to the author. So he was saying that through my whole career, I've been interested in the, in the search for life elsewhere in the universe. So I'm just blown away that this is even possible. Now, what I quite like from his quote is that he's actually promoting or asking people to actually look into his data and make any comments if they find something interesting. So if you look at this simple quote, what he's actually encouraging is for development of the field. And that's simply done by checking new data and getting data from other researchers, putting it together, reanalyze it, and so on. So it's just a way to, to advance science. And this is something that's becoming very, very common in many journals, and is that you have to um, include information about the author contributions. So what every author did in the paper. That has been stated. This is another example, it's called Improving Data Access, Democratizes, and Diversifies Science. And the major claim here is the, this, this one. Analysis show that improved access has substantial and positive effect on the quantity and quality of lands that, uh, lands that enable science. Improved data access also democratizes science by disproportionately helping scientists from the developing world and lower ranked institutions to publish, on their, uh, publish using Landsat data. So what happened here is that they made some uh, 
very specific data, very high cost data, they made it available. And that enabled different countries that didn't have access to that data or didn't have the capabilities to actually produce the data to actually publish new findings using that data. So you can see, for example, the black dots here represent the, the new countries doing data. The gray dots are the ones doing um, that already were using these this, uh, data sets. Now, this is an example from neuroscience. And then again, it's a correction. There is some little mistakes, but they corrected it, which is normal design is also. But then again, uh, the section on author's contributions. So it says what every person did, and that's stated in the paper. And look, uh, you might think that this is just being too fussy about small things, but actually it is good because down the road, for some reason, someone might read this paper and might find something interesting and they would like to know who was behind certain aspects of the paper. Let's suppose they love the methods. They like to know who was in the data, anal the data analyst. Um, they like the theory so they can see who developed the theory and so on. And also it's like a memory for the same authors. They can keep track of what they need. If you publish constantly, you might forget exactly what you did in the past five papers that you published five years ago, three years ago. So it's like a good reminder of what your job in the paper was. Hey, George, how's the sound? It's okay, a little bit of fading here and there, but keep going. Okay. Everyone seems to feel like right. we're good to go. So you might yeah. just want to burn the microphone when you're done, but it's good. Yeah. <laughs> it's going well. <laughs> okay, just let me check something here just quickly. No, 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 just just ignore it. It's it's literally a fade in and a fade out. It's not yeah. any of your settings. Keep going, just forget I said anything. What about this one? Um, let's, well, try it. Seems to be fine, yeah. but keep going. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, and of course, they have availability of data and materials. Now, this is the paper I was mentioning early on about transparency and reproducibility in artificial intelligence. I highly recommend it. And the reason is that you have people like John Ioannidis, who you might know by now, is a person who started the, the whole call out in relation to replicability. And also you have these big names, these two guys, Robert Tipshirani and Trevor Hasty are key names in statistics. So you really cannot miss these names. These are the guys talking about statistical learning, which is actually called, in my view, wrongly, machine learning, but it's statistical learning. That's what it is. Um, for those in the field of computational research or compu uh, computer sciences, there's also this nice paper that gives you 10 simple tips as to how to do uh, reproducible computational research. So what I'm doing basically is, I, okay, throwing in the topics, the key issues, and also giving examples of where you can find um, these practices being done and some tips about it. So this one is one of those. Now, like I mentioned before, um, open science is linked to the concept of pre-registration. And that's something that actually many journals are asking these days. And okay, I'm gonna show you why it's an important thing to do. Now, I have to be honest here. A few years ago, okay, I became familiar with this issue of uh, pre-registration and open science maybe five to seven years ago. Prior to that, I was just doing my typical research, which is do an experiment. Okay, you do your power analysis. Oh, not even that. Just get some participants, um, get your stimuli, call the experiment, get the participant, participants going to a laboratory, analyze the data, and submit the paper. That was a typical way of doing things. I didn't even care about replicating a previous study because I thought that's a waste of time. It was already done. So why should I bother doing it? But then you will see that um, the way I think now is quite different and there have been some readings that were quite influential and I'm gonna share those readings with you because they kind of opened my mind to see the relevance of embracing these kind of practices. And it's not simply because you just want to be self ratios but it's because in the end, your research becomes more solid and believable. Okay, so these are two papers 
that are actually talking about pre-registration. As you can see, there is a, a person who is behind all these things, Brian Nozick. Uh, again, you see uh, John Ioannidis. So you see the usual suspects, but these are the guys pushing these ideas. Okay, so this is the pre-registration research flow. So I'm gonna show you, first of all, the typical way in which we have been doing um, publications. So you theorize, you design your study. Obviously this part is skipped, you don't pre-register. You just jump into data collection, analyze it, write the report or the manuscript and submit to the journals. And then the reviewers evaluate every single aspect of the manuscript. And then there are two options, uh, three options. They reject, they ask you to revise or they accept it, which is very, very unlikely. I mean, I haven't seen a paper that has been accepted after the first submission. All right, so that, that is traditional way of doing um, publications. Now, these are the other two alternatives. So you have the unreviewed pre-registration and the reviewed pre-registration. So the difference here is that in this one, you do all these things, you theorize, you design the methods, and then at this stage, what you do is just, um, you basically, you put in a repository, it's open to anyone, and it's time stamped. And after that, you decide to submit to a journal. That's totally fine. The outcomes are basically the same, reject, revise, or accept. Now, in this one is where you actually approach a journal that offers pre-registration, and then you start to negotiate with them aspects like the theory, the design, and the analysis plan. So that's what you submit to the journal, these three things only. No data collection at all, no discussion section, nothing. Just the theory, the design, and analysis plan. And then the reviewers give you feedback for you to improve sections here. Okay, so once everything is done, okay, it's time stamped, and then you can you carry on with the normal process, which is submitting. Now, what happens here is that uh, there is an advantage of this pre-registration using the, re the review pre-registration, the RP RPR. And is that when you pass this stage, chances are that the paper, when it reaches this stage, is accepted in principle. Um, accepted in principle means, all right, so we gave you feedback on the theory, on the design, on the analysis plan, you did some changes, go back to us, we made you more feedback and so on, and then the paper is in good shape to go. That means to go means to collect data. So that's why they say it's accepted in principle because you will do what we agreed on at this stage. Then you collect the data and you use the statistics that you promised you will use. So let's suppose you said, I'm gonna use a t-test because you believe the data has certain properties that meet some assumptions, statistical assumptions. So you believe that a t-test is the best choice and that's what you're gonna do. You're not gonna use any Wilcox uh, test or anything, like non-parametric test. You just promise a t-test, parametric test, and that's it. And that's what you use. And you thought there was gonna be a difference between groups, didn't happen, that's fine. That's what it is. And that's what they publish. So if you found nothing significant, that's what, that's what they're gonna publish, that you found no significant difference between groups. That's it. And chances are that, as you can see here, you are more likely to be accepted because you followed you already did this stage. So this is the key part of this review pre-registration. You did this. Once you pass this, basically you are in. That's the whole message. Um, this is a few papers. I quite recommend this one if you want to share it with your students. It's a very nice one. Or even for yourself, it's, like, it's pretty, pretty good. It gives you um, a nice account of what open science is and some, um, some advices as to how how to, how to embrace it. Okay, now this one is just an example of the quality of the journals in relation to um, open science practices. So that's the name of the journal. And these are the key graphs in the paper. So as you can see, it's like uh, journals that are Q1 have a low probability of no policy, whereas Q4 journals 
have a high probability of no policy. By the same tokens, like the reverse image, Q1 journals have a stronger policy of um, um, open science, and these guys in Q4 have a low probability of uh, embracing strong policies in relation to, to open science. So it's just an example of how journals are embracing these practices and how that reflects in the quality of the journals. So I took these images from this website, which is, it's, it's, not, it's not a website, it's a blog. It's by Wagenmakers and Doodleith, 2016. So they just basically cartoonize the benefits of um, embracing open science. Now, um, I'd like to mention something briefly about this part here. As I said before, when you do a pre-registration, you might say, okay, um, I want to compare these two groups and I want to use a t-test because of the best you know, or simply because you are very sure of the statistical assumptions of the data. So you say, yeah, a t-test is fine. Now, that doesn't mean that you cannot do anything else. You can do it. You can do a weak oxygen test. You can do a quantile analysis, whatever fancies your mind, but you have to present that as an exploratory postdoc analysis, okay? And you don't make a big noise of it. You can actually put in the supplementary materials. You can comment it as a footnote, but the focus is on what you promise you will do, not in the other new thing. Because then again, you start to see things like p-hacking and harking and all those things, which I'm gonna mention later on. So you see like, it's not like, mm, it's not a straight jacket you can actually promise to do some extra analysis that you will present as exploratory. Now we go to the field of reproducibility, replicability, and robustness. Okay, so this is the preprint I was mentioning to you before, which I highly recommend. Again, Bram Nozick is one of those guys as the authors. But it's pretty nice because it presents uh, a good summary summary of how things are in relation to how things in psychology are in relation to these topics, replicability, robustness, and reproducibility. And I honestly believe that it's like um look, it's not saying that I don't want to portray the image that psychology is the field to follow. No, there could be many other. You have medicine, you have uh, embryology. Um, bacteriology, name it. What's happening, however, is that as George said at the very beginning, in psychology, we have been rechecking what we have been doing. So we were happily just carrying on, carry on doing more experiments and so on. But then we decided to look back and think, okay, is this right? What happens if we try to do it again? And that's when things started to, to change and the self-correction started happening. And it's happening, still happening. Okay, so some definitions here. So replicability refers to re the reliability of a prior finding with different data. That's why it's called the replica replicability crisis. Uh, conceptual replication is uh, basically a generalizability test. And this one is basically what is happening, what is happening now is that, that kind of replication, conceptual. Uh, there's another one called direct replication, which is very, very unusual and very, very hard to do because you need to have the same stimuli sample from the same population with the same characteristics that you found in the paper that you tried to replicate. It's, it's very hard, it's very hard. And I haven't tried it myself. I have done a couple of conceptual replications that seems to be easier to tackle but the direct replication is a bit is a bit more complex. You need a lot of control for that one. And when it comes to obs observational studies, it's a bit even more complex. If, in a, if it's an experiment, an experimental study, okay, you have access to the materials, perhaps you can sample, you can try to find the same sample, match it up. But when it comes to observational data, it's, it's more complex. Uh, now, reproducibility is the reliability of a prior finding with the same data and analytical strategy. So basically this one refers to you putting your data out there and me being able to run it again, the codes and find the same thing that you found. 
that's what it's referring to. And this one robustness is the reliability of a prior finding with the same data and different analytical strategy. Now, this one is pretty cool because this one refers to how strong your data is in order to survive different analysis. That's the main message. So for example, um, there are many ways to analyze data. There are many ways to analyze data. A simple data set can be analyzed in different ways. So if your data set or your finding can survive, let's say eight of 10 analyses, that is a good index that is a robust finding. Now, going back to how things started. Well, like I mentioned to you before, in 2005, um, you and some friends published this paper in relation to neuroscience. And that was a big call out for neuroscience because in neuroscience, the issue is that the data sets tend to be huge, but behind every single data set, there is a lot of technology. Now, that technology is understood only just by some, and these some people, this bunch of people, they produce the methods to analyze it. But like, most people were just using, this data, uh, using these technologies, carrying the experiments, carry out experiments, and using their default methods to analyze that kind of data. And then they found some mistakes with the software, but also the bigger picture is, okay, your samples are very small, which is understandable because in neuroscience, it is it's very expensive and time consuming to run um, experiments. For example, if you're using fMRI, that's expensive, takes a lot of time per person. If you're using EEG, that's also a pain because you have to have the proper gel, you have to decide how many channels you will use. You have to decide what's gonna be the baseline, if it's gonna be the nose or behind the ear. Okay, there are many things. So that was a call out for neuroscience. So now, okay, all of this, the, the reason I'm mentioning this is because you might think, okay, so if it's difficult to run experiments in neuroscience with larger sample sizes, what can we do about it? And then you will see later on some strategies that I think are useful. I have been using them myself for my experiments and they take some time, they take a lot of preparation, but it's very fruitful. You, you see nice results in the end. Okay, so this paper is from 2018. It's a long paper because uh, in this journal, Behavioral and Brain Sciences, they tend to publish discussion papers. So it's pretty long and it's two columns. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a long read, but it's very interesting. I mean, you have the target paper, which is this one, and then you have main names replying to this target paper and making comments on that. And the authors have to reply back to them. So this one is a good one to see the whole thing behind the replication crisis. Now, this paper is still in press. Um, it's called the Reproducibility of Statistical Results in Psychological Research and Investigation Using Unpublished Raw Data. This paper, to be honest, was uh, is painful to read because you see the pains the authors went through in order to be able to reproduce some of the findings of, of past papers. And you can see it here. It's, they said we were unable to successfully reproduce the underlying statistical results for almost one third of the identified conclusions. Moreover, around 5% of these conclusions do no longer hold. Successfully reproduced conclusions were often the result of cumbersome and time consuming trial and error work, suggesting that the prevailing reporting in studying psychology makes verification of statistical results through an independent analysis at least hard, if not impossible. So basically the message is, look, these guys, I mean, this paper is incredible because like I said, they went through a lot of pain just to find out that it's hard to, to reproduce some of the analysis and results. And it's simply because the way um, these are being reported. So it's an example of why we should actually facilitate things for other people interested in reproducing or replicating studies just by uploading data and codes. Um, in relation to replicability, um, I'd like to mention this project that is happening uh, here in Australia. It's in Melbourne University. Um, it's part of the collaborative, okay, CAT stands for Collaborative Assessment of Trustworthy Science. And this is the goal, this is the goal of the whole thing. 
The aim to crowdsource predictions about the credibility of published research in eight social science fields, business, research, criminology, economics, education, political science, psychology, public administration, and sociology. It's the first time I see an initiative of this large scale happening. And the nice thing about it is that this thing is actually co-funded by DARPA. So that gives you an idea of the seriousness of or and the importance of this kind of uh, initiatives. I mean, the reason why this is happening is because they want to revise, okay, they want to without the research that is useful from the one that is not. Which is robust? What kind of research is robust? Which one is replicable, reproducible? That's what I want to stick to in all these fields so you can move forward. So I like this initiative to be honest because I think it's just clearing the field So if you type just replicates, um, replicates project on Google, you'll find the, the whole website and you see the people involved, the publications they have ongoing. Actually last night, I read a couple of papers on the methodology that they use for this particular project. And that's, that's for a different talk, but it's basically, um, it's basically based on Bayesian statistics. It's a technique called expert knowledge solicitation. So expert knowledge solicitation is a technique that allows you to pick out the knowledge from experts in a particular field using some techniques. So you can create some kind of prior distributions in relation to their knowledge. But anyway, that's a, that's, that's a different thing, but that's the methodology behind this initiative, which I, I think is fascinating. All right, so what can we do in Oracle Data Arts, which is reproducibility, replicability, and robustness? Okay, so like I mentioned to you very early on is, okay, seven years ago, I never considered these topics. Um, I maybe have heard the word replication or reproducing, uh, replicating some studies, but I didn't care about it because I thought, why should I waste my time redoing something that was done? Now, happens that if you look closely, most of the studies, at least in psychology, I'm not, I don't know in educational data mining or learning analytics, but in psychology, most of the studies, I would say 98% or 90% are done in Western cultures. So all the samples are from the US, from the UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, but it was very rare to find studies conducted in non-Western countries. And the paper that opened my eyes to the situation was this one the weirdest people in the world. Again, it's in behavioral and brain sciences. It's a long paper, long discussion, but it's very, very informative and really makes you realize how some of the cognitive processes that we take for granted are actually, you can take them for granted, perhaps in some Western cultures, not anywhere else. And those are the things that need to be revised. And it's like, okay, you want to test a theory, okay. And the suppose that theory comes from another theory that was based on a paper in 1985, successfully published in a good journal, and you want to try it out in some Latin American countries to see if that really happens. That's the way to start. It's a way to check, okay, how this apparently ingrained cognitive processes like memory, let's say, inferencing, uh, mental simulations, are these things generalizable to most societies? So that's the kind of work um, we should be doing. And I've been striving to this kind of work in my research. Like I said, it takes time, but pays off. And this paper is the one that opened my mind to, to these ideas. Okay, so thanks to COVID, we are now moving more than before to do online experiments. And these are some of the tools that <clears throat> are being used for that purpose. Now, the reason I mentioned this is because these tools allow you to collect data online and then you can have uh, good sample sizes. That's, that's a nice thing about this. I mean, from a, look, I'm, I'm telling you this from, from the point of view of an experimental psychologist. We were used to collect data in the laboratory, okay? So if we're using EEG, we need the person to come to the laboratory, to the tasks, while the person is holding is having the cap on their heads. 
okay, that that was yeah still happening, but it's not as often as before because of COVID, and we know we know that we know that now, so we have to resort to other kind of uh, platforms or ways to collect data, and these ones are some of the best that you can find to do those things online. Uh, actually, I just got the news that apparently Psychopy, this one was a good tool to collect um, reaction time studies, but apparently they mess up the whole thing when they turn it into online. So I wouldn't say this is now the best to collect reaction times. There is another one called Testable. It's called Testable, it's a testable Software. It's another tool that you can use for online um, online studies, and you can collect reaction times. You can present images. You can do lexical decision studies, uh, face recognition. Just name it. Okay, so this one was the paper showing that comparing different uh, different softwares, and they were saying that yeah, Psychopy seems to be the best, but some colleagues were telling me that yeah, apparently it's not the case. All right. So going back to the issue of uh, collecting massive data from different uh, from different countries, different cultures. Okay, a few years ago, now it's 2018. This is fairly recent. Uh, this initiative happened. It's called the Psychological Science Accelerator. So what they do is basically they have a, a database of laboratories around the world. So what you do is let's let's suppose you have an idea. You want to test. Um, Mm, a, a particular current process. You want to test if memory improves when you do X or Y. So what you do is you send a proposal to them. It's like a pre-registration. You send the theory, the design, all these things, except the data collection, of course, and they will give you feedback. You get back to them and so on. Now, if they approve it, they like it, or after you agree with them, you, you, you reach some middle ground. Um, they disseminate your study among the many laboratories they have in the database, and then they respond to you saying, okay, I'm in or I'm out. I have the facilities, I don't have them, and so on. Now, now the nice thing about this is that you end up with a very decent sample size, and it's representative from different countries. So these guys have um, collab like database laboratories in countries in Africa, in Europe, obviously, in North America, South America, in Australia, in, and in Asia. So basically, they cover all the continents. So this one is a nice initiative. And for example, I don't know if in education there is something like this, but I think they should. They should have one. Because these guys, my understanding is that they only run psychological experiments. You cannot propose anything related to education unless it has a clear psychological component or cognitive component. And these are some, some of the platforms that you can use to, to collect massive data, like Prolific, Amazon Mechanical Turk, and so on. So these two are the, the major ones, to be honest. So imagine that you can, imagine, okay, you can collect data in sites, for example, in let's suppose you send it to a psychological science accelerator and you manage to get 10 laboratories from 10 different countries. Still, you can use data from um, Amazon Mechanical Turk as a control check, for example, as another population. So you can get something like 1,000, 2,000 participants easily in less than two days. And if you leave the, the survey open for a week, you can get even more. So this one is a good tool too. But then be mindful, be mindful of the samples that you're targeting and the populations you're targeting. Because there's a quite huge difference between the people in these platforms and the participants that you get in selected laboratories in different countries. Uh, so an example of uh, large scale studies is this paper from 2018. It's called the Moral Machine Experiment. And they had the luxury of collecting data from 40 million participants in 233 countries. This study is phenomenal. I think it's amazing. And it's published in Nature. And it made a big splash in the field because basically it, it is talking about 
what is called HAC, the Human and Artificial Cognition Interactions, one of the main topics there. But I think the method is just, um, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. And it's a paper that gives you some idea of, it's actually a good paper for, uh, that speaks of in relation to generalizability. So you will feel confident with the findings in this paper because you might say, okay, well, they have a decent sample size. It's just 40 million. Oh, whereas most of the studies have been having 35 participants from a university in the US. So I think this kind of finding is a bit more reliable than typical papers that you find in all journals actually. Now, the last topic to cover is the issue of measurement. Now, I have to say that I'm a huge advocate of this because I believe if you don't have the right metrics, you just don't have the right results. That's how I see it. You have to run the the good a good experiment to be able to pick out the finding that you want to be to be able to identify the factors behind the phenomenon that you want to study. And for example, in the case of uh, learning analytics or education research, I would say that uh, psychometrics is something that has to be looked at. You cannot ignore that. Simple as that, because it's the me it's measurement of the mind, measure of psychological processes. So if you, if a learning analytics and educational data mining wants to say anything about psychological processes, they have to look into these psychometrics. If he's gonna talk about how to design the dashboard and or anything like that, okay, that's fine. You can ignore psychology because nothing to do with the mind. But if you're gonna say something about any learning related process, you have to point to this. Then again, stressing the idea that psychometrics is the measurement of psychological processes through testing and assessment. Now, I just want to mention a key, uh, a concept that is related to this one, it's called psychoinformatics, which I've seen also being called computational psychometrics, but it's exactly the same thing. So there's no difference. And actually, this concept psychometrics was a psychoinformatics was proposed before the concept of computational psychometrics. Uh, this paper is already published. Um, I highly recommend it. It's, um, it's a call out to most research in psychology that tend to use um, assessment tools. Um, now, what happens here, there is, they call it questionable measurement practices uh, in relation to, it's like a mock version of the questionable research practices. So the, the term questionable research, research practices came out a few years ago. And that concept was basically telling people, okay, you have to do research this way, publish your code and so on. That basically is an acronym for uh, open science. But these guys are using the concept of questionable measurement practices just to refer to how people have been using assessment tools or psychometric tools. So, and they provide very nice uh, tips for, for future work in the area, how to improve these measurement practices. Uh, all the things that relate to questionable research practices, that's, that's, that's why I call it QRPs, is the topics of low power, as we saw before in the paper by Ioannidis, uh, saying that neuroscience tends to have small sample sizes. The p-hacking, which is when you cherry pick the p-values that you want to show because they are below 0.05, or if you are in fond of the new proposal of 0.05, so any p-value before uh, below 0.05. And this is harking, which is hypothesizing after the results are known. That's what it's called harking. So some solutions are uh, to perform what is called multiverse analysis, uh, to rely on robust and novel statistical techniques, and to provide both explanatory and predictive power and predictive models. Now, a just simple thing here. These explanatory models are the typical statistical analysis that you find in most papers. So let's suppose I run, I run a t-test and I find a statistical significant difference. That's an explanatory model. Now, if you cross-validate that, that becomes a predictive power, a predictive analysis just by cross-validation, or by comparing it with other models, that becomes a multiverse analysis. 
but I'm going to show this uh, later on anyway. Now, I just want to uh, mention briefly the issue of big data. And it's because, as you know, in educational data mining and learning analytics, big data is, is something that is, is part of the field. Uh, now, um, there is this uh, couple of book chapter and paper that I highly recommend because they talk about this, the implicit assumption that big data and fancy analysis and methods allow relating principles of scientific rigor, such as measurement, construct validity, and reliability. Now, what they're saying is like, okay, you have to be careful with this kind of data because you might think, okay, just because I have a huge data set, I can make big claims, but that is not the case. It's like you're saying, I'm replacing good statistical analysis, good methods, just by having a large data set, and that's not the case. There is a nice paper by, I don't know guys, if you are familiar with the name Bradley Efron. So Bradley Efron is a statistician. He was the guy who developed and invented the bootstrap technique. He published a paper last year, slashing and smashing machine learning and big data. It obviously favoring statistical analysis. And the arguments that he presents are very compelling. That's why, um, Personally, I'm not really carried away by the word machine learning. I just don't buy it because in my view, like I said at the very beginning, that's pure statistical learning. So statistics, just rebranded. That's my opinion. Okay, so some of the things to consider when it comes to big data, and I'm not gonna read this out, but you can find it in this book chapter. They talk about robust science being relevant if meets some of these things being rigorous if it meets some of these things, being replicable if it meets some of these things and so on. So like I said, this table is found in this particular book chapter, which I recommend. Now, I, like, I quite like this message from that same book chapter. They say, because big data analytics have a natural inclination toward quantitative empiricism, the underlying philosophy often encourages data mining Probing, they say data mining is probing data for unplanned or unanticipated relationships to generate insights postdoc. So it's a strong message. It's a strong message, and it's just saying, okay, just be careful with what you do with big data. And okay, the authors have a very particular perspective on what data mining is for them. They say that it's probing data for unplanned or unanticipated relationships. And I could like to stress this part, just to keep it in mind. Um, now, when it comes to multiverse analysis, this is the key paper about it from 2016. And basically what the paper is promoting is the following. So this is the traditional analysis. There are many ways to analyze data. You do it this way, they give you a significant path the significant p-value and you report that one. Now, a planned analysis is, okay, I'm gonna do this. And that's what you report. That's more similar to what you do in a pre-registered uh, report on a pre-registered study. And this one is the multiverse analysis. Like I said before, there are many ways to analyze data and you report them all. Now, I can tell you by experience because I have been doing this lately in my studies, my papers. This one takes some muscle because uh, you have to change your mind from parametric to non-parametric to semi-parametric to Bayesian if you want to, to machine learning, well, statistical learning and so on. So it takes some time, but in the end you can see a pattern of results. This paper just simply, simply uh, it's an example of how one single data set can be analyzed in different ways. So I just recommend this paper if you want to have a look at how that happens. Because that's what they did in this study. They just said, okay guys, analyze this data. We want to see if X is larger than Y. And yeah, they, they found that every single researching group came back with different types of analysis. These are some statistical papers, basically stressing the same idea. And something that has been, look, I have been fighting with different journals in psychology because they seem to be unaware of these methods. Well, this paper is fairly recent, but these methods, to be honest, they have been developed from the, from 19, 
1983, when John Taki and all these people started talking about, uh, for example, the median interquartile range, median absolute deviation, and so on. And these statistics, they are being used for further elaborated methods that you can find in robust statistics. So I highly recommend to have a look at these ones because look, the message is very simple. Data, as we know it, don't follow most statistical assumptions, which is normality, homogeneity, for example. Those two are the, just to mention those two, most data don't fulfill those, um, those wishes. And these methods are particularly designed to tackle that kind of data. Now, this one is an interest of mine too. So, like I said before, I tend to move between these ones and nowadays I'm using this one. It's a new technique, it's called GAMS, which stands for uh, Generalized Additive Models of Location, Scale and Shape. It's a very, very flexible uh, regression modeling technique. But then again, distributional is not a typical linear regression. So I'm not gonna give away the whole thing behind this, but I recommend you to have a look at this paper. It's from 2018. It's a very nice technique, which by the way, has been compared to some machine learning methods and performs just as good. And the advantage is that this one is explainable. You can understand this because it's, it's, it's in a regression context. And basically anyone understands regression these days. Uh, this one is just talking about, okay, we have to use two types of approaches, explain and predict. So explainable models are, for example, a typical linear regression, whereas if I cross-validate it, it becomes a prediction model. That's what it is. Um, in psychology, this paper came out in 2017, basically proposing something that was said in 2010 by Galit Shmueli, she's a statistician. So, yeah. Basically selling this idea into the field of psychology. Now for the future, maybe another talk, I'd like to talk about the advantages of what's something called prediction surveys. So the prediction surveys are, it's a recent tool that has been used to basically have mm, a large scale assessment in relation to how likely a study is to be reproduced or to be redone. And I'm actually doing this right now in an experiment that we are doing with some colleagues. So we collected data in different countries, but we, are, we, are, we just collected data through Amazon Mechanical Turk in relation to the prediction survey. So we collected the data for the study, different countries, and with Amazon Turk, we got people there to respond to how likely is that that study that we are doing is gonna be replicated. So it's like a, you know, like a balance between, okay, what you think is gonna happen, and what people really think is gonna happen. Fernando, can I just pop in for just a yeah. second? You got about four minutes left before we need to wrap up. Yeah, And Thank uh, you. I've been looking at questions. The only one I had really was around PowerPoint saying it would be available later. I have. So uh, yeah, keep going. Yeah, you got sure. it, but we'll wrap up right at the hour. Yeah. And yeah, so the conclusions are embrace open science, strive for addressing the three R's, which is reproducibility, replicability, and robustness resort to newer statistical learning methods, robust statistics and distribution of modeling. I'm not saying these are the only ones, there are many more like, for example, linear quantile mixed models, uh, quantile regression and so on. There are many, it's like a candy shop, but just try to use something different. And I really recommend adopting multiverse analysis, which actually forces you to look back into this, which is you can use this, you can use this, you can use whatever you want, but report them all. And like I said, it's time consuming, but it's highly enlightening. Ah, well, these are just other things that maybe in another talk I'll do, but just simply, there's a nice paper called uh, Constraints on Generality, which is from 2016, I think, which is basically when you make claims in the discussion about your results, try to be a little bit humble and honest as to the limits, the limitations, and the generalizability of the findings. Also, um, consider experimental approaches because you have control of the data generation, the generating process, and try to use explainable machine learning algorithms. And I think that's the end, George. 
All right. Uh, well, fantastic, uh, fantastic timing, uh, Fernando. Yeah, thank you. Uh, looking at here, the only question, there was a comment that Gloria uh, shared uh, around an article, the weirdest people uh, discussion, importance of understanding context in our publications. And, you know, one thing that's really interesting, uh, Gloria, thanks for, for raising that, is that there's a, a huge growth of interest that you're likely aware of in general in society that treats the research outputs and certainly the use of research as less constrained by a neutral context, meaning mm -hmm. a context really doesn't exist. It's not, it's not like you can just sort of say, this is the output and that's what's true. Everything is a factor of context and especially data and the data that's being used in uh, learning analytics or in artificial intelligence models is heavily biased to the types of data that were used to inform or to train or to develop the models. So it, yeah. it is something that the, the importance of context and bias and ethics and fairness uh, are certainly growing in, in increased attention. I'm wondering uh, for the last section, Mm -hmm. uh, Fernando, if you could maybe just share a little bit, some of your thinking around algorithmic bias or fairness with algorithms and maybe just provide a little bit of an indication and, and perhaps uh, any resource that you want to share about work that you're doing here. Mm. Well, that's a very good point, actually. So, okay, so I have to mention that uh, when I started this position in 2019, prior to that, I had no clue about what um, I, would, I was asked to do research on hack, human and artificial cognition interactions. I had no clue about it. I know about the human part because I did experimental psychology, cognitive psychology, that's fine, but I didn't see the AI component. So I started reading about different things and one of the topics that stood out to me was uh, something called that they call ADA, which is algorithms, data, and AI. And I really see now the how intrinsically related they are. So in my view and after, doing some readings, I, I cannot say that I've read everything, but I've read some key papers. My view is the following. You have data, the data fits into the algorithms, and the algorithm is basically powering the AI, the AI agent, be a robot, be an app, whatever it is, but the algorithm is, is the soul behind the AI. But then again, the algorithm is directly affected by the data. Now, so talking about like um, algorithms, that has become a, an interested, an interested, um, an interested of mine. And, and it's at the moment I'm looking into how people trust algorithms. So we are running a study in different countries. I think we have 15 countries at the moment collecting data. And we are aiming to have 150 participants per country. So it's a simple study, it's just, Presenting people 12 scenarios, six scenarios refer to situations where algorithms are being used in a low stakes context. For example, an app recommending restaurants. And six of them, the other six refer to high stakes, like an algorithm sentencing someone to jail, for example, which is what happens in the US with the Compass system. And getting people to rate if they would be recommending this app or this algorithm to anyone else or if they or if they would use it themselves. Also, we are checking their level of statistical literacy. So our belief is that there should be an, an association between the degree of statistical literacy and the trust in algorithms. So all of this to say that, yes, as George was saying, there is a clear link and direct link between the data and the algorithm. The algorithm is, is, a, mathem is a mathematical property. And I mean, we have statisticians in the in the in the group here. I can see Ernesto, Ernesto San Martin, statistician. He can he can vouch that any algorithm is just a mathematical thing going on. It's a statistical formula doing something that is meant to do in a very clear way. Now, the algorithm itself cannot be blamed, but the data can be, because if the data is biased, the algorithm is gonna basically show you what the data is like, that's it. That's what's happening exactly with the Compass system in the US. The database has most crimes for black people. So black people are more likely to be sentenced to, to jail than any white person. So George, I don't know if I answered your question or maybe I deviated too much. 
Or George left. <laughs> Yeah, I think we lost him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, things are gone. Okay, so does anybody have any question? Awesome, thanks, Fernando. Yeah, no problems. And um, I'll just go ahead and sign us off. Um, say that um, we just uh, invite you to um, continue to come to. Uh, future uh, learning mm -hmm. Ellipse learning network events. We're going to uh, get a, a number of events uh, hopefully for the rest of the, uh, the academic mm -hmm. term and uh, and then uh, throughout the next year we'll have on learning analytics um, learning network the website as well as um, Twitter. Make sure to follow us. If you need anything let us know. And again thank you Fernando have a great one. Yeah thank you. All right. Thank you everybody. See you next time. Mm -hmm.